Well, I think it's about the right time to start. Lena Lobova will present on uh, the art of ne negotiation. She has been organizing Get IT. This is an international conference for several years. And uh, in her past, there's actually managing a game dev company. Let's uh, give her a round of applause and uh, hi. Hope you can hear me well. So I am a founder of the conference uh, Get IT, and Logos was my company in the past. Now I'm also consulting game companies in BizDev, and uh, I'm also a member of several game projects right now. I've always been working with the game world, but also I was handling uh, partnerships, negotiations, interaction in various forms. Because when you want to find motivated speakers, uh, when you want to find great partnerships, you have to spend a lot of time networking, communicating, interfacing, going to conferences. And I'm here to share my knowledge and uh, my ideas, my observations, and maybe even my philosophy in this respect. And I hope this helps a few of you, a few among you. Well, first, let's travel in time 15 to 20 years back. I was still at school back then, and I was enjoying history much more than physics. And I think this is something that every one of the people from my class would subscribe to. And I'm now much more interested in physics myself. I, I read Anthony Hawking, I watch educational videos, and now it's much more exciting than history for me. But back at school, physics seemed to be a very dull subject. And the reason was, of course, that our physics teacher was just repeating the manual, the, the study guide, word by word. And, uh, well, while we were amazed at first uh, with uh, his uh, memory capacity, but uh, we soon got bored. While our history teacher was always adding something to uh, the textbook, uh, she's, she, given, she was giving us vivid uh, descriptions of uh, the people in the history, she changed uh, also, in a way, uh, the testing system to make it more exciting. So, all in all, she managed to sell her subject to us. She motivated us, and we were teenagers. This is, is a big challenge, as you know. While our physics teacher was just trying to convey the contact, the factual stuff to us without doing anything to motivate us. But he didn't even try, so he failed at selling his subject to us. Therefore, all of us are selling stuff, uh, whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not. We are always selling our projects to investors, we sell ourselves to employers, we sell knowledge for attention. That was the case with my teachers back in history. And if you look at sales not as just exchanging the goods or services for money, but as making someone exchange what we want for what we have, then it works for everyone. This is not necessarily monetary. It can be attention, it can be resources, it can be skills. And I think that the word sales in its core sense has a negative attitude. We instantly resist because we, we have this flashback that we are being sold something that we don't want. Someone's pushing something onto us. And I think that this was the case, but back in the day, when the seller had more information than the buyer. 
This is not the case now, especially if you look at sales in a broader sense. In our industry, we pay most of our time to the product, don't we? And we believe that if the product is good, it will sell itself. And we sometimes forget that uh, interaction and communication contribute to the product's success in a great, to, to a great uh, level, don't they? Uh, say, look at the example of Apple. Uh, I think uh, they testify to the fact that uh, having a great image, a great brand, is something that can sell your product, no matter what it is. So now that we've uh, realized that uh, there's buying and selling, there's exchange everywhere when you hire, when you want to learn, and so on. Are there project managers in this room, actually? OK, a couple. OK, so can you imagine with me that, say, we have a project manager called Vasya, and he has this new feature in mind that he wants to make part of the product. It's nothing to do with the sales, but when he wants to introduce this feature, he goes and talks to his management, trying to persuade them that the project needs this new feature, and he has to convince them that the timeline has to be shifted, the deadline has to be moved, that he has to receive this and that resources in order to change the product. So he has to sell his idea to his managers. Well, sometimes the idea is great, but uh, you cannot really move the deadline. When this is the case, he has to go back to the team, maybe, and persuade them to work over hours, to work extra time in order to make this happen, sacrificing their free time, maybe not traveling somewhere, not taking a day off, not attending a conference. Uh, and once again, he wants something in return for something else. There are many other such instances. So I would now like to invite you to understand what is it that you selling? Is it a skill? Is it a product? Is it a project? Uh, is it an idea? So once you know what you're selling, I want you to, when you keep listening to my presentation, think about it through the eyes of what you're selling. Then you will have much more personal attitude and questions in the end of my presentation. To move on, we need to understand what are we selling how are we selling and to whom are we selling? This is the very fundamental classic approach. But we will approach it differently um, because this is, as we accept it now, this is a constant process of exchange. Even now, me on this stage, I'm selling you my ideas in return for your attention. So it doesn't really matter what is it that you're selling, because the big idea behind any type of product or service you're selling is that you're offering a solution. Say you have, you've bought a picture and you want to hang it on a wall. What will you, what will you need? We have uh, the painting. We have the wall. We have these two. What else do we need? We have the knowledge on how to attach it to the wall. Perfect, yes. Tools. What kind of tools? It can be a hammer. Uh, or we can use a drill. You, you, need, you need to make a hole, basically, in the wall, right? Do you have a hammer? Who has used it over the last month? And who has uh, a drill at home? Who's used it in, uh, over the last month? Last year? OK, OK. So you use that. Some of you use that, rather. I actually have the statistics that 
when you buy one, you normally use it for about 30 minutes. So what you need in the end is a hole in a wall. This problem does not have to incur the use of your private hammer. The solution can be a neighbor, for example, that can come and help, or an outsourced service. So have I been clicking too much? So have I moved with my presentation too far? So you can hire someone. Say if, if you hire a marketing director via an outsourcing company, then this is done in order to solve the client attraction problem. If you make a product and you hire someone then, you end up with these new people attracting, bringing in sales. In order to get something, you need to offer something, right? The solution to a problem to your customer, to it, which can be many things. It can be a person, it can be a, a, an audience, it can be a community. In order to do that, you have to understand what the problem is. And of course, you're in perfect position to do a sale if there has been no solutions to it so far or those that exist have been much more, exen much more expensive than yours. So problem finding actually now is uh, as important as problem solving because Sometimes, say, a company uh, is not doing as well, but they don't know why. Therefore, if problem finding, problem analysis, and then if you give them a solution, then you bring in much more value when you just run around offering their solution. Therefore, you have to think about the possible audiences that there are and what kind of problems they have that have not been yet resolved in the best manner. So you have to think what, what is your value proposition. You really have to make sure that what you're offering does solve a customer's problem. When I was working with outsourcing, we had uh, quite a few such situations when, for instance, uh, there was a company who was doing um, art for casual games. So they would go to a conference and they would arrange a meeting with a CV project or with some sort of buyer. And I, I would ask them questions, so why would you want to have such a meeting? And they would say, well, we can meet, we can show, you never know. And this, I believe, is the worst way to kill your precious time at a conference. Your interlocutor's time as well. Of course, of course, you have to have meetings, but the meeting has to have a clear purpose, and that should be how you can help them. Go and look at their website, see what they're doing. Maybe they're hiring someone. If it's a AAA company, they can be at some point overloaded, and um, they might want to not have enough resources to create, I don't know, landing sites and so on. And you have artists who are great at that and uh, you can come up with solutions to just that specific problem. Therefore, you need to be very aware of your value. Value proposition is a big topic in its own right and I don't really have time to go through it in detail, but these are the key points. First, when you analyze your your target audience, you have to know what are their pains and what are the gains that exist there. Pains is, is the problem, is where they have to spend the money that they don't feel like spending, what makes them uncomfortable, stressful, what negative consequences they face. And you are there to think about the pain relievers something that can reduce their suffering, their discomfort. At the same time, think about what gains are there. That is, what gains can be made when your customer starts using 
your solution. This could be increasing revenue, enlarging the audience, new information, and you have to be very specific about your game creators that are part of your proposal, part of your solution. The tools that will get the customer closer to their dream, that is, in most cases, to be as successful with the least effort. And if this does happen, then it's a perfect win-win. The customer solves the problem and is happy to thank you for that. So there are game engines, as you know, okay? There are game engines that you build into your games, makes things faster and, and smoother for you. And the best in engines are in high demand, so is there's demand, they are successful. Therefore, your game successes your success as game develop as game engine developer is a direct consequence uh, from the success of your customers. In okay, so once you know what your value is, you have your value proposition clearly set. You know the problem range you can help with. You know that there are people who would really care. Next, you have to think about. Uh, who you want to offer this to. There's, of course, a big domain of market research, target audience selection, and so on. If you need want to learn more, ask me. I can give you hints where you can read about this. I would talk more about the things that are not on the surface, more technical stuff, perhaps. Sometimes people forget that we sell not to entities, not to abstract companies, but we always sell to specific people. We're not just working with Apple or, I don't know, Pineapple. Um, we always interface with specific people. No matter how exciting your proposal is, it's up to the person on the other side of the line to make the decision. Brian Croner said that you never know whether you're B2B or C2C you, or B2C. You, it's always H2H, human to human, person to person. And when you're making a list of potential customers or companies, try to make this list with the name of a specific person from that company. Even if you fail to meet the decision maker, still, Dealing with the specific person determines how your proposal will move along. There's always a human face to any business interaction. You do prefer some people over the others. And you are more successful if you are more open, if you're willing to help, if you're ready to enlarge your contact network and if you are someone who can communicate and enjoys communication if you're someone who knows how to handle negotiation when i was working in a logos and i was i remember i was hiring a top manager who had at the same time a lot of different offers and some of them were better in terms of uh, uh, salary I only learned it later on when he was already working for us. And he said that he chose us because I liked you at uh, my interview. You seemed to be open and fun. And uh, I thought I would enjoy working with you more. So you should never underestimate uh, the value of communication and the value of your network. Try to know all the key people in the industry because these people are the people who will help you achieve your goals. Maybe it's not going to happen instantly, but at some point they could be your employer or employee or be someone who will help you with advice. And just knowing them, introdu being introduced is not enough. You have to make sure that they know you. Sorry, uh, my clicker is out of control today. 
So at least you can follow what they're doing, read what they publish, play the games they make. Okay, how many of you actually play games? Once a day, once a day. Okay, cool, thank you, well done. So you know the market, right? How how will you know how a cool game should look if you don't know what those who are thought to be cool look now, right? If Then when you do have a chance to meet those key persons, oh, now I, now I understand how it works. There's, there's, a, there's a magic to it. Uh, okay. So at least you should follow them and then when you meet them, you're meaningful to them because uh, you've been following what they do. Sometimes in the industry there's a lot of shy people. It's not only IT, but there are many be many industries where it's like that. And sometimes when you overthink such as, well, I'm I'm scared, this person is too cool, why would they they would look down on me and so on. But this is really quite silly, isn't it? The worst thing that can happen, they will ignore your question, you know, or they will listen to whatever you said and they will take your business card and will never get back. Okay, that's the worst case scenario. But think about the best scenario. You can get an advice. You can get a potential customer. You can get a potential mentor or even a friend. Thanks to such approach, when I was, I don't know, scared a little or... When I was shy, I managed to Im approach a lot of interesting people. This is how I met many customers for iLogos, how I met my mentors that have shaped me as a professional, that has uh, that have uh, made me what I am professionally. Most people come to the conference with one goal in mind, meet the interesting people, There are more goals than you want to discover new talent, you want to learn the new, of the new ideas, and maybe you are the talent others are looking for. What are the tools uh, that exist to open up your contact, net contact network and meet the influences in the industry? Well, of course, uh, it's the conferences like this, uh, and this includes uh, the informal events, be they uh, parties or dinners, because people there, they normally have more time, they are not in a hurry to see that presentation, to give an interview and so on. They have time for you for an informal chat. There are, of course, uh, social media and uh, professional networks. We're very lucky that in the 21st century, We, if we want to contact someone, no matter who that person is, we don't have to buy an envelope uh, and a stamp. We don't need to then mail it, snail mail it to someone. We can actually contact almost anyone, almost any time. Whether they respond or not is another issue, but this alone is a great, great Achievement of our times, isn't it? Another thing that I have here is a personal brand. This is something that attracts people. This is what makes new connections come up to you. The personal brand is also a part of uh, what you are and how you behave. Uh, it's almost identical to the company brand. And it works as an association that people have when your name is mentioned. So when you attach your personal brand to your value proposition when everybody instantly realizes that that's what you do then you've done great for yourself of course one of the ways to cheat here is to uh, make acquaintance of best networkers people who already have a lot of contacts and who love creating new connections these kind of people are normally hr managers they event managers sales managers journalists any other any other type of uh, job that, that 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 are good at that dating agencies someone said okay so this is uh, perhaps 
adjacent, not necessarily directly part of our industry. But anyways, uh, these are the people who communicate with many people. Event managers, they're easy to approach. You can just come and help. If you really offer help, then for the next conference, I will spend, if you want to spend time to help us, I'm sure that there will be a job for you next time. This will, in return, give you an opportunity to meet more people and uh, your karma will improve. Why am I paying so much attention to networking, to the connections and their importance? We all have an activity. We all help others solve problems. We have our own problems as well. And uh, the tasks and problems that we face are likely to be shared by others. And maybe it's very likely that there is someone who we know who's trying to deal with the same problem. They could be the person or they can know the person who is doing that directly. Let's uh, try and uh, get a little more engaged and run an experiment right here right now i will i will i will start with a question if i may say i want to have my next conference in st petersburg i'm not from st petersburg but i want the conference to be here and i have to start with some info materials business cards uh, leaflets posters so First, I need someone who can print this for me. Is there anyone who knows such company in St. Petersburg that can recommend one? You there. Okay, thank you. There you go. This is how I just solved one, one problem. There's another project I work on right now, and this is actually true, uh, for for indie developers, and I'm looking for mentors for this project. I'm looking for mentors in game analytics. Do you know people, maybe, who could could do that? Okay, there, there's someone. Fantastic. So that's the second problem solved. Now let's let's take someone from the audience and help you in a similar fashion. I'm sure you all have something. Maybe if we can have a mic there. Hi. Hi, I'm Dmitri. I'm a third year student at Itmore. And uh, we, we, we're trying to, to do some game development with my friends. We've been doing it for a year so far and uh, I've been trying to find people in this city in St. Petersburg who will be willing to help students free of charge to work on their product and I don't even know where to, where, where to start looking so so are you looking for finding for funding well ideally yes it it may not necessarily be funding it could be also just sharing experience and someone who could devote their time someone who's experienced could devote their time to us so do you have uh, someone who's uh, who can finance or give a share of their time for just for pure experience to do that to help that oh, there, there's someone there i have some people as well so you can do you could give many examples and to, to many problems the answer is just ask okay so far we've uh, figured out what our value is that we're actually helping people to solve their problems now we also know the people we can sell this to we broaden our our network and we're getting ready sorry it's all gone messy okay I have my presentation back so now we prepare for the actual negotiations always do prepare this is very important and please make sure that you have a brief elevator pitch uh, 
that will describe your value and your product and your and your questions who who has that who has that that short pitch already pre-prepared okay well, there's two people very well uh, please think about it the rest of you because this is not an anecdotal situation it has happened to me even even that classic elevator meeting you know scenario I was in Vegas remember uh, uh, the dice conference and I met uh, there are people like Kajimo or Romero you know and I, I, I met someone someone um, very important to me and we and I only had time when we traveled from floor one to floor six and this is your chance right this was my chance uh, to for them to memorize me for to remember me and uh, and maybe meet me next time so how much time do you think Apple spent uh, to prepare a presentation uh, well it, it's a lot of hours sure I found information about that this is, uh, may not be very current but <coughs> it what I found is 250 hours for one presentation and this is only designer marketing and executives times I'm sure there's many more people who work on that and I think it's well over 1000 hours I'm not saying that you should spend 250 hours preparing for every meeting but you should spe spend some time to learn about the company to learn about the person and if you do know them try to update the information try to look for updates try to follow the news of the company not uh, to look silly when you turn out to be unaware of important facts but also to show interest because it's nice when you see interest in you in other people also try to find your common interests things that you share this creates human warmth this creates uh, this builds trust I remember when I was meeting this executive from a game company and I looked at him up in LinkedIn and it turned out that he was interested in the same social problems that, that as I few people actually fill that in that's why I'm very interested in in this kind of people he described his values and uh, I thought that that was uh, very cool and I started our conversation uh, with that uh, in the end we we shared uh, links and references and uh, most importantly we had a positive start to our conversation and uh, an icebreaker if you know who you're going to be meeting with, try to look up their background, their personal story, and think how this can influence your negotiations. Maybe you have an offer for the company, maybe you have a solution to their problem, but it's always the case that uh, game designers, producers, or business developments uh, have a different look at these problems therefore you should spend time uh, uh, to customize your offer depending on the specific person that you're going to meet if you didn't have that time then you can always start with it start with what they're doing right now what are their future plans what they do they want to achieve at this conference ask them about how they got into the industry this is much better than to start with uh, you know self presentation without showing any interest to the company uh, ho just hoping that that they like something from what you have to say try to o offer 90% of uh, the possible benefits in to, to your customer and don't keep only 10% uh, for yourself you don't have to push anything 
onto them. You don't have to make them buy. You sp should spend this time trying to demonstrate how you can jointly resolve the problem that the customer has. You're not telling them what to do. You're not aggressively insisting, no. You're not threatening, of course. If you do that, then people won't be listening. Try to create uh, an environment of cooperation. Share them that you're on the same boat, that we share the problem and uh, you, that the solution is important to you. It, uh, it also works with uh, your employees. If you want your employees, say, to perform well in their daily tasks, well, of course, they should always start from you giving something. The, and it's not the salary that I'm talking about. That is, start with advice, start with consultation, start with mentoring, start with uh, creating a, an atmosphere of trust rather than just telling them what to do and ordering them around. No matter what type of negotiations you're having, there's always three elements to any such interface. First, on the ground, you have the I know. This is the data. This is the fact. This is your knowledge base. This is something that can influence where you can influence what, what you know. Here, it's about argumentation. Or rather, no, at the top, in I think, you work with argumentation and in order to change what the person thinks. But at the center of this, it, there is the, I believe, the emotional element. This is what the people believe in. This is the hardest element to change. But this is also the biggest influencer on the final decision. This emotional element is what my history teacher had and my physics teacher didn't. There's also a catchphrase running that people don't buy what you do, but they buy why you do it. Investors in, in various accelerators or foundations, they frequently look at how excited the founder is how into it the founder is. Because they are really into it, they're likely to learn to be able to do it well. If there's someone who has a lot of experience but is not very interested, not quite sure why he or she is doing that, then we think that this person is not likely to show a lot of initiative or try very hard when they have this job. If there's someone with less experience at the interview, but at the same time there's a lot of enthusiasm and they seem to be willing to help, then it looks like uh, this is someone who will freak, who will f learn very fast and catch up with uh, the first person in experience, but will be much more motivated and enthusiastic along the way. So, of course, you need the data and the stats to sound persuasive, but at the same time, why is the strongest influencer? Because this gives you an emotional harmony with the person. This, this connects emotionally through your, um, with the interlocutor at the communication setting. After you've had the negotiation, of course, it's time to agree uh, about how you follow up. I've never had just, you know, one meeting con contract situation, you know. Money doesn't really normally change hands at the very first meeting. So you are therefore are likely to discuss how you follow up. But please also note it down. I remember when I was uh, thinking of myself as a biz dev hero with a phenomenal memory that I didn't need to put things down, but with my very first GDC conference, when I came home, 
with you know hundreds of business cards and uh, you look at them after a while and and you forget and you think so why do i have this what were we to discuss with this person and how did should i go about it so please make notes another thing when you have negotiations uh, try to memorize an interesting detail that you can keep that you can reuse it in your future conversations, which will uh, serve as a connector and uh, as an icebreaker again when you reference your first meeting. Let's get back to sales and why do they frequently have this negative aura around them? Well, it's frequently about competition, as you know. And if the market is high, highly competitive, then no one's winning. That's why you try to find a, a blue ocean situation and where there's a big untapped market and not invest a lot into saturated markets. If you look at the, the sales trainings, there, of course, there's, there's, there's a lot of competition which is assumed. And there's also frequently a war model behind this training design. This used to be the situation back in the day when there were more problems than solutions in the market. But game dev, dev uh, has been progressing at a very fast pace now. So there are now still more problems, but, but a lot of solutions and a multitude of options now. Therefore, it shouldn't be about battling, about trying to leverage more for you, but rather this is about working together. All innovation is collaborative. And for you to be successful in this, you need to bring in together many people or even sometimes companies. Let's let's think about a game that is cool now, that, 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 that you're playing now, Overwatch. Okay, Overwatch. If, uh, think about its, its, its history. It, it has a production, a game dev, uh, there was a producing, production team, there were artists there, and so on. There were maybe some companies they were using through outsource, someone who were doing 3D textures for them. I'm not sure in detail, but anyway, they, they could have also involved external sound designers and so on. For mobile games, you, you normally work with traffic providers or publishers uh, to PR, to, to, to present and follow the launch of new games such as Overwatch. Uh, you sometimes want to bring in a marketing company and so on. So this is very unlikely that just one company will uh, be able to do everything as successfully. Therefore, people are just have to work together. And it's easy to make people collaborate, say, Wikipedia is a place where people collaborate for free. Other open source projects like that also exist. What companies do now, it doesn't really matter what they can, what they want to achieve, it's rather what they can offer to their target audience in order for them to achieve their goal. Let's get back to the example uh, of uh, game engine. This is something that, that saves the developers time. And the community does not just take the engine, but they give back with time, money, or skills. They, they give feedback, for instance. They help the engine developers to improve their product. Here's another uh, three-party scheme where there's a developer, publisher, and player. Say the developer gives the player game experience in return for feedback so that the game can be better. Then the developer will share 
waste publisher the, their revenue. And the publisher will have access to the game and the opportunity to find this game on a big market. And the player will uh, reciprocate with uh, either money or time. There could be also many more elements to this scheme, such as a platform or investors, or something like that. But it's all about collaboration. It's easy to ask if you know what are the goods that you can reciprocate with. If that is the case, people are willing to share. They're willing to share experiences, um, money, whatever, what have you. Look at crowdfunding. And please remember that we all sell all the time, be it money, time, skills, products, projects, our games. In order to be successful at it, we have to remember what our value is and what problems we can solve for our customers. And of course, remember about networking. The more people you have in your personal network, the more value your proposal has. Say, if it's a platform, the more developers it has, the more content there is. The more content, the more users. The more users, the more developers. So it feeds back uh, to the beginning. But it started with relationship between the platform and developers. If you're offering something useful, then it's a win-win for everyone. The customer has a problem solution. You receive demand. The industry in general also wins because if uh, you make uh, your work in a better fashion, then the industry moves along. So think about it. Maybe it's not the competition that's moving things forward. Maybe it's collaboration. If you like this idea, then I have good news for you. We could start helping one another right now because now we are at a conference and this is just the right place to meet and offer help and ask for help. Therefore, if you like the idea of collaborating as a key to success and as a vehicle of progress, I invite you to m meet someone you hadn't known before. Learn what their problem is and try to offer your solution. And then tell about what you do and why you do that and try to engage them with your ideas. Just as my history teacher uh, managed to engage us, the unruly teenagers, back when I was at school. Thank you for your attention. First, first question, of course, it was me who drew the slides. It was me, I did it on paper, and then I scanned it. A any questions other than, than mine? Are you all just hungry? There is one, yes. Hi. Say, I made an interview and you want to demonstrate and I want to demonstrate my skills, I want to show my portfolio, but of course you want to engage on the human level. But say, but say if the interviewer is, is a male or a female, uh, should you really leverage this aspect in any way? Well, this is something that does influence the situation. Let's not pretend that we are all super neutral and super tolerant. For some people, it's just easier to work with a guy than with a girl. And the opposite can be true as well. Say, if 
there is if the interviewer is actually looking for a girl and then you shouldn't feel bad about it because it was a wrong match from the start for you as well as for him therefore it, it would not have been perfect for you so so don't regret it there's a a lot of tips about uh, how you should behave at uh, an interview uh, first some companies are public about their values you can look it up but be wary about it because they the real values are sometimes different uh, so my advice is to talk to people who work there try to find you know friends of friends who work there and ask them about what kind of uh, environment they have and uh, what kind of values the people who work in that department have and what uh, kind of person they are and try to plan your strategy based on that. But don't really bend over backwards to achieve that. Because if you sell someone else at an interview then, and then go back to your normal self, then it's uncomfortable for you. But if you want to impress, it's best to find out about the, the people who work there and about the specific person who will be interviewing you. What is their outlook? What is their background? And so on and so forth. And it, it, it works, I think, I think beyond, beyond just male-female divide. You can ask about that. Uh, but this is, I think, just one of the elements in the puzzle. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's another question. We, I think we can take another question. Thank you, Yelena. Well, thank you. I'd like to find out how do international employers right now look at potential employees from Russia? You know, in many countries, there's a procedure to demonstrate that you really need to hire that this is the unique person that, 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 that you have to have. Well, it's difficult for many countries. I'm from Ukraine, but I, I think my experience uh, translates well for, for Russians. I've uh, worked, uh, I've spent some time in the United States and I've seen this on the ground there. I looked looked it up. In the United States, it's 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 almost impossible, but you. It normally works as follows: that you have to have to you have to work in the European office first, and then they can take you over to the states. There are examples, but I think they're exceptions, and now it's even more challenging. There are more opportunities in European countries, but. For the company, it's normally a challenge to hire someone from uh, the former Soviet Union. So it is, it is a challenge, but opportunities are there. But please, don't um, other countries who who are more perhaps acceptive, Canada or. S elsewhere. Well, I'm I'm not an expert in this specific field. I have I have my personal vision. Maybe I can share that later. But I don't think uh, I am an very knowledgeable in, in this respect. So the, these are uh, guesses rather than knowledge. Okay, uh, I have a question of my own to conclude with. What are the tools and uh, that you use in order to collect, say, all the data, all the all the tips that 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 you all the information bits that, that you have from a conference say no I, 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 I well I do I do because you can't really just 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 memorize it you know uh, just after two months that I started to work in uh, 
this industry, I ran out of uh, my memory capacity. Therefore, I have to, I have to get machine aid to my human intellect. And uh, for iLogos, we were using Salesforce. It works well for a large company when you have several people who work in sales, for example, and when you have to, to coordinate, when you can give different levels of access to different people. But if it's only you or you have a small team, then I don't think it makes sense to learn, to, to spend time learning this uh, program. Uh, I think you could start with uh, the Google Doc, uh, well known and easy to learn tool, which is uh, where you can easily organize things as you, as you want to. I've been using different approaches for a while, but say if you have a Google Doc where one tab is a conference, so I, will, I can see where I met this person, and then I will have the name, company, and what we, what we spoke about. But I think that this, in general, is useful. Another another good uh, idea is to have a tag that is, this is a publisher, this is an indie developer, so that you can filter out these people, but also tag them with a city or country, so that when you travel somewhere, be it for business or personally, so that you would know that, that you're there, maybe you, you can meet that person go to see them at the office, something like that. For many people, it's also valuable. Uh, it, it makes sense to use LinkedIn or Facebook. But there, the problem is that there's, there's a lack of structure and sometimes you have contacts that you don't want to have there. Well, some people then stop using Facebook, you know, so social media remains auxiliary for me and I have I have my own database, so to say. So thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, there's another question. Yeah, one question with two mics. Thank you for the presentation. My question is on your experience at conferences. Say you met someone at a conference and then you look through your base and and you realize that you need this this person so how do you contact this person after five years well of course it depends how much you need this at this moment in time because the people that you want to meet or who are nicer do you think they're nicer I, I keep contact keep in touch with these people but I can this can be very different I can I can uh, talk to them once a month or once a year if it's just a fun person but you're not really friends then or you don't have a, a business need to contact them, then it's uh, it's enough to just add them somewhere or, or like them on the social media, something like that. This, this works for me as well. When I see someone follow me and like my stuff, I, I keep, uh, I, can, I, can, I can keep, uh, in my memory what this person is it takes only takes a second to like a page right so this this works really well but for the people that I want to stay in touch with I I know that I want to remind about about myself be it for business interest or be it for personal interest if I really like them as a person before I go to a conference I normally look through the people list that I met with at the previous installation of this conference or the people that live nearby some conferences you know when they don't have a meetup system or 
you can't see through the list of participants, then I just ask them directly, oh, are you, are you going there? Uh, and even if they don't, even if they don't, they will be reminded of you, right, of your existence. It's important to not just bother them for no reason, you know. In, in the outsourcing world, sometimes they just ask, well, do you have a job for us now? And they have to say, no, we don't. And in two weeks they say, do you have something now? And they don't. So this is likely to irritate people and uh, give a negative impression of you. It doesn't mean that you don't need to contact, but it's important to have a reason. You can say, we had an NDA product, now it's uh, open you can have a look maybe you need something like that if you do that if you share an info or uh, bring in some news then you remind of course uh, of, of, of your existence and but you're not being irri irritative at the same time there's a lot more that, that that I can share with you but I think it's time for lunch isn't it so is it Am I right in thinking that you try to keep contact with ev with everyone you met intermittently? Well, yes, in general, yes. Uh, Kate Afferazzi, uh, fantastic uh, publication with uh, a lot of tips. Uh, also, never eat alone. The book title is uh, so. Try, try to look it up. Well, thank you so much uh, for this. I think we. We finished uh, with this presentation now. Thank you. We break for lunch, don't we?